It's lovely to see you again. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. I like to, I, one of the things I don't like to do is just go and visit a church for a Sunday morning. Um, because I feel it's very, um, it's very one-sided interaction that way. And, um, and in order, I, I believe that, you know, this, this, the, um, the Bible says God is set in the body, and then it describes the gifts. And um, anyone that carries any kind of a ministry is set in the body. They're not just kind of parachuted in and then disappear out again. And, um, uh, and I think it, it, makes it, it makes ministry, and it particularly equipping, much more effective if you actually get to know each other. And so... Um, so I did, I, did I, I remember actually it was a few years ago with, uh, with my good friend Ezekiel Shabemba and he called me and he said, he said, I'm calling to see if you'd come and speak to the church on a Sunday morning. And I said, no, I won't do that. And he was like, oh, I said, but I'll come up for the weekend and spend some time with you and, and, and get to know people and, and, uh, and, and then I'll speak on the church on the Sunday morning as well. And, um, <coughs> but, but I, so I, I very much enjoy the kind of getting to know you folks and, um, and I'm, I'm hoping to get to know you uh, in the way that we're told to, that we should seek to know everyone, which is after the Spirit and not after the flesh. And we're going to do that because we're going to hear, I believe, many of you this evening moving gifts of the Spirit and actually have something to say. Part of being a prophetic people is having something to say. Um, the Scripture says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Okay, so the fact that we're the redeemed of the Lord, the fact that we have been saved, means we've got something to say. And um, one of the things we've got to say is, I'm saved. <laughs> Jesus has saved me. He's taken away my sin. He's given me a new life. And, um, you know, that's, that's, uh, we, were, we were talking in the, in the car. I got up a little bit uh, earlier this evening, had some food with, with, uh, with Dave and with Harry, and we were talking in the car on the way back. And... What, we, what I want to try and touch a little bit this evening, and maybe if we say it right at the beginning, that kind of sets a context, is that spiritual gifts have a particular function within the church and within the gathered church, but that's only one, if you like, one half of the story. That's only one half of the coin. The other is that there's, the gifts are there to equip us to be witnesses in the world. And there's a scripture I like, which we'll get to in a minute, in 1 Corinthians 14, 26, and it begins by saying, when you come together, each one has, and then it describes things. And there's an implication, I think, there, that you bring something with you. It's like the psalmist would say, bring an offering and come before the Lord. We bring something, and, and some of us are well attuned to that when we gather on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night, that we're, we're expecting, well, I'll have something to bring, I'll have something to contribute. But do you have that same idea when you leave your home and go out into the world through the week, or when you go into your workplace, or when you go to, down the pub? I don't know, do you go down the, down the pub around here? I don't know. Christians, are you, 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 yeah, you are allowed, okay. Um, <laughs> the, when Jesus tells the parable of the sower, he begins this way. He says, the sower, a sower went to sow. <laughs> Who are you? Who has the Holy Spirit made you to be? A witness of Jesus Christ. A witness goes to witness. A witness doesn't go to do the shopping. A witness doesn't go to go to work. A witness doesn't go to the football match to watch a game of football. They first and foremost go to witness and have something to say about who they are and about who Jesus is. So I believe that we learn and we get familiar with the things of the Spirit in the community of the Spirit but that equips us and prepares us to go out into the world and be men and women of the Holy Spirit wherever we go. So if we end up with a particular focus because we're in a church meeting, on church meetings, I don't want you to think it's in any way disconnected from the rest of life. Um, in fact, this is, this is, if you like, the, the muster ground, <laughs> the parade ground. What does Psalm 110 say? It says that, it says that, that, you, that, that, your, that you will, you, your people will be willing. And some translations say your people will rush to your side in the day of your power. That when Jesus takes his stand, which I believe he's doing right now, when Jesus takes his stand, his people rush to his side and say, we're here and we're ready. They kind of, and I see that very much of that kind of like, you know, the, the army gathering itself and being ready for the command. 
Is that how we think about what's happening here, that actually we're here being trained and equipped and then we're sent into the world? I believe whenever we come together, we ought to have, we ought to leave not with a sense of, oh, that was a good meeting or that was a bit of a duff meeting or where should we go for lunch today or whatever else it might be. We should leave first and foremost with a sense of I'm being sent. I'm being commissioned with that kind of, it maybe won't be, not every week is it going to be as life-changing as it was for, for, for Isaiah when he, when he says, here I am, send me. But there should be a renewed sense that I'm, I'm going, I'm, I'm going equipped and sent and commissioned um, on the mission that God has got for us. Anyway, so let's, should we look at a few scriptures? Let's look at a few scriptures. And um, uh, we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. 1 Corinthians eleven seventeen. 17. We're just going to flip through a few, a few scriptures in, in 1 Corinthians. It says, in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. Some translations, you, if, if this is the translation you have, you can let me know which one it is. Some translations put it, when you come together, it does more harm than good. Yeah? <laughs> New living. When you come together, it does more harm than good. What, uh, what, what, what a, what a uh, you know, stinging judgment from the apostle. When you come together, it does more harm than good. Um, well, I, I, I thank God that, that you are not like the Corinthians, because I'm, I'm utterly convinced that when you come together, it, it does more good than harm. And let's set the bar there to begin with, shall we? That whenever we come together, it does more good than harm. <laughs> um, and I'm pretty confident that we, that we hit that bar as well. Um, in, uh, let's jump now to the beginning of, of 1 Corinthians 12. See, the, the problem with the Corinthians wasn't that they lacked in spiritual gifts. In fact, Paul says you, you don't come second to anyone in spiritual gifts. The problem was they weren't very spiritual. They were, they were very carnal people. Um, and in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1, he says, Now concerning, and, and again my translation says, concerning spiritual gifts. But the better translation is concerning things of the Spirit. Concerning things of the Spirit. The word there is pneumatikos. It means things to do with the Spirit. Not just limited to gifts, but a whole way of living as spiritual men and women. Like, like Paul says in Romans 8 verse 9, you are in the Spirit. You are spiritual people. So concerning spiritual things, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. Some translations say I don't want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's difficult to imagine that Paul means this literally, because I actually just said the words, Jesus is accursed, because I read the Scripture. So, the Holy Spirit didn't make my lips seize up so I couldn't form those words. <laughs> and equally, there are people <laughs> who are not born again who can say the words, Jesus is Lord. But I think he's saying something much bigger, that actually, when you're a man or a woman of the Spirit, the, the, the natural inclination of the Holy Spirit within you is that everything you say somehow says, Jesus is Lord. That's perhaps another way of understanding what it means to be Receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you'll be my witnesses. We make that proclamation, Jesus Christ is Lord. And if we're going to be men and women of the Spirit, and if we're going to be more at home in the things of the Spirit, and of course that means moving in the gifts of the Spirit, one of the things that's going to help us is to realize that everything we do by the Spirit is to proclaim and affirm the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I believe, actually, that's the primary thing we're doing every time we gather together as believers. That's the primary purpose of worship, is to make our stand together and say, Jesus Christ is Lord. And we are the community of people whose primary confession and identity is, Jesus Christ is Lord. It's a good, important 
reason to have the name of Jesus in lots of the songs you sing when you worship, just to avoid any ambiguity or confusion. It's Jesus Christ who is Lord, not some kind of uh, vague concept of God that you can imagine in all kinds of different ways. No, Jesus Christ, born of Mary. I don't know my creeds very well, but there was a reason they said all those things that rooted him in history, suffered under Pontius Pilate. There we go. It's important stuff. We need to know which Jesus it is we're talking about because that's the Jesus we're proclaiming. Jesus Christ is Lord. So when we're speaking by the Spirit, however we are speaking, and you know, in verse 4, Paul goes on here, there are a variety of gifts but the same Spirit, varieties of service but the same Lord, varieties of activities but the same God. Nice bit of Trinitarian formulation there for you. Um, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. And again, I think it might be the New Living that says there is something of the Spirit in everyone. (laughs) But there is, to each is given the manifestation. Manifestation means made known, made obvious, made visible, made tangible. So the Holy Spirit has invested something in each one of us that needs to come out of us that is given for the good of all of us. So... I'm either trying to convince you of something that you think is true of everyone except you, or I'm trying to just encourage you and remind you, you can can take your pick. But we need what the Spirit gives to each of us. And then he goes on and he says, to one is given the utterance of wisdom, the other the utterance of knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, working of miracles, prophecy, the ability to distinguish between spirits, various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Um, Okay, let's jump from there. Chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So, 1 Corinthians 12, the Spirit will give as he decides. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, earnestly desire. (laughs) So there's... You know, there's, the, the, we are not trying to... The, the, the Holy Spirit is, is, is eager to give us the gifts, and we are eager to receive the gifts. We're not trying to work against him. We're not trying to twist his arm. Um, we're, we're, this, is, this is how we engage with what the Spirit wants to do. Um, and Paul now begins to bring in an important idea here, Um, and he does it by contrasting tongues and and prophecy, and he says, look, if you speak in tongues, you build yourself up, you edify yourself, Um, but if if you prophesy, then you build up the body, and the language that's being used here is the language of house building. It's the language of actually putting stone on stone, and building the house. And I find this really helpful then to think about what is happening in the church when we move in spiritual gifts or in things of the Spirit. We are building the house that Jesus is building. I will build my church. We are, we are the other, what's the, the picture that Peter uses? The, the, the spiritual house made out of living stones. We're positioning the stones, which includes ourselves, in a way that means that the house is being built. It's, it's coming to its fullness. It's becoming more and more visible. And then if we go to verse 26, which I already uh, partially quoted, then what should we say? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. So here is, here is kind of, if you like, Paul's touchstone as to what should and shouldn't happen in a church meeting. So we've gone from 1 Corinthians 11, it does more harm than good. <laughs> we've temporarily set the bar at let's do more good than harm. But now Paul is saying everything, everything should build the house. Everything should build the house. 
You know, sometimes things come in that aren't helpful. Have you ever, have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed sometimes, sometimes there's kind of contributions to meetings that are not the most helpful thing? And uh, Paul gives us some help with that here in 1 Thessalonians 5, 19. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything and point out the failures of everyone that gets it wrong. No. (laughs) Publicly rebuke. No. Test everything and hold fast to what is good. So there's some discernment going on there, isn't there? That's the weighing, I think, that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 14. We weigh the word that comes. We hold fast to what is good. But you know, once you've, once you've discerned what's, what's good and you've hold, held fast to it, the, the weighing hasn't ended. Because I think the, the, the other part of what it means to weigh the word when it comes is, first of all, yes, we, we need to make a, a a discernment and a judgment, is this God speaking? But if it is God speaking, what are we going to do about it? Because he says here, don't despise prophecy. And I think I said this on Sunday. We don't, most people don't despise prophecy by going, oh, prophecy. I hate prophecy. People don't despise prophecy by bad-mouthing prophecy conceptually. People despise prophecy by hearing it and doing nothing with it. And so the other part of weighing is, is just like, you know, you remember the, the, the writing on the wall? Many, many tackle you pass, and you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. How many of you still have? I, I would imagine Sue would be the kind of person that would have one of these. Do you have those kitchen scales with actual individual weights? You don't have one of those, Sue? No. You got one? John and Julia? You've got the, yeah. Okay. So if you want to weigh out seven ounces of flour, you find the correct weights that weigh seven ounces and put them in one side, and then you pour in the other side until it's in perfect balance. And I think that's the image of weighing the word. The word comes and it sits in one pan of the scale and we're in the other pan. And um, one of them is going to need to be changed until it's perfectly in balance. And the thing that's going to change is not the word of God. <laughs> it's, it's us. And of course, there's a weighing personally. What do I do? How do I have to bring adjustment to my life in the light of that word that's come? And a word when the word comes to the church. How do we bring adjustment to what we're doing in the light of the word of God? Anyway, when you come together, each one has. Let's back up a little bit here into, um, if I can say, I think, um, I think tongues are, are a vitally important gift. And I don't think 1 Corinthians 14 in any way diminishes tongues. It just helps us understand the, how they should function. And, 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 um, and one of the things that's unique about the gift of tongues, it's the only gift that primarily works inwardly to the person speaking. All the others are are, are outward and and, and are for the body. And Paul makes that contrast that when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. So if for no other reason, and again, it's that same building the house, building this house, building my house, my house that I'm like the wise man that listened to the words of Jesus and built his house upon the rock. It's building the house of my life. It builds me up. It brings me to maturity in Christ. And, I, and, I, and, and Paul says, doesn't he? He says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Um, and I think there's no, not, there's no, there isn't a disconnection between what he says there and kind of his claim at the end of the chapter that if anyone thinks they're spiritual, they will acknowledge that what I'm saying is the truth. <laughs> he's, he's kind of very subtly, or perhaps not that subtly, kind of <laughs> claiming a spiritual maturity beyond any of those reading it. And, um, and, and I think those things are, are, are probably very much connected. So I want to encourage you to speak in tongues a lot. But let's have a look at what's happening when we speak in tongues and how it relates to prophecy and revelation. Because prophecy as well, I think we can take prophecy as 
um, if you like, an overarching gift that speaks for all the other gifts that we might think of, like word of knowledge, word of wisdom, uh, faith, um, discernment of spirits, all these other gifts, in a sense, they're all prophetic in that they're about making known uh, the mind and will and word of God. Um, so that's just to say that the lots of things that we can say about prophecy will also help us understand those other gifts. So, uh, beginning of 1 Corinthians 14, pursue love, earnestly desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in a tongue speaks not to men but to God, for no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. First thing I, first thing I found out here when I read this is that my spirit knows the mysteries of God. Don't think it knows all of the mysteries of God. But you see, my spirit and the Holy Spirit are infused together. Many, many lifetimes ago, I used to be a chemistry teacher. And happy days, blowing things up in the lab and all that kind of stuff. But one of the things about gases and spirit is pneuma, is wind, is breath. It's a, it's, a, it's a word that describes gas. One of the things about gases is when you mix, when you put two gases in the same vessel, it doesn't take very long until they're completely intertwined. You're breathing right now primarily a mixture of two gases, oxygen and nitrogen. Oxygen is essential for life, and there's about 20% of it in the air. And if we had significantly more than 20%, it would poison you. So the nitrogen is there in a, this, this what, what scientists call a dynamic equilibrium. Okay? There's a, there's a balance that's going on. And in here, when I was born again, my spirit came alive in Christ and has continually been in a dynamic equilibrium and fellowship with the Holy Spirit ever since. And that's how my spirit learns things, <laughs> through hanging out with the Holy Spirit. And my spirit, when I pray, speaks mysteries to God. So your spirit and my spirit know things that our brains don't know. Isn't that wonderful? It's particularly wonderful when you kind of realize that over time, brains can let you down. But the spirit doesn't. The outward man is wearing away, passing away, but the inner man is being renewed day after day. Like I said on Sunday, that what we, what, who we are in the spirit is, is, isn't corrupted by age, sin, sickness, death, doesn't get weary, doesn't wear out, is renewed day after day. And when I speak in tongues, I'm speaking mysteries to God. So let's, let's hold on to that idea that my spirit knows things that my mind doesn't know. And my spirit knows things because my spirit is intimately acquainted with the Holy Spirit. I remember, uh, and I'm going to misquote him badly here, but you've probably heard him talk about this, Roger Aubrey talking about speaking in tongues. He says, the reason that there's often a bit of a battle in the mind when people are, are, are first kind of um, engaging with tongues is because when you speak in tongues for the first time, it's the first time something's come out of your mouth that hasn't gone through the filter of your mind. Uh, and, but that's important. That's part of how we establish that we have minds that are set on the spirit, not minds that are set on the flesh. The human mind is an amazing thing and was de always designed in the plan of God to be led by the Spirit. It finds its greatest faculty and function when it's set on the Spirit. And speaking in tongues helps me get my mind in the right place. So the one who speaks in a tongue builds himself up, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now I want all of you to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy, the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues unless someone interprets so that the church may be built up. I'm not quite sure that Paul is intending there, by the way, that we use what he says here to kind of give ourselves elevated positions in the church. Oh, I'm better than you because I prophesy and you speak in tongues. I think he's trying to turn on its head the kind of the, the value system that the Corinthians had. That, you know, well, you know, 
only, only kind of immature people need to actually understand what's being said. Us spiritually mature, we can just soak it all up in tongues, that's fine. And I think he's kind of turning that on its head and kind of saying, no, actually, it's when understanding comes that there's greater value. Um, and then he says, now, brothers, if I come speaking to you in tongues, how will I benefit you, you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or teaching? Um, I know I'm, I'm not particularly tasked with speaking on tongues and interpretation this evening, uh, although we are going to do a bit of it in a minute. Um, there's a few things that we can understand about tongues and interpretation from this. First of all, tongues are always spoken from us to God. But then Paul says, what good is it if I speak in tongues unless I do one of these things, um, bring revelation, knowledge, prophecy, or teaching. And I don't think he means I'm allowed to speak in tongues for five minutes as long as I do a bit of teaching later. I think they're more connected than that. I think he's telling us, you know, tongues are spoken to God, so, but when they're interpreted, the interpretation could come as a revelation. It could come as an instruction. It could come as a prophecy. Of course, it can also come as a prayer because that's what the tongue is in its purest form. And that's why it's an interpretation, not a translation. It's not a word for word. It's catching something. I think often what happens with tongues is you hear the tongue and the interpretation, if you like, is almost an answer to the prayer that's been prayed in the tongue. Um, that's certainly the, the kind of the sense I often have when I interpret tongues. By the way, this is always helpful because we're told we shouldn't bring a message in tongues unless we know there's someone present that interprets. I know that I can move in the gift of interpreting tongues. So if I'm ever in the room and you feel that the Holy Spirit has given you a tongue, okay, so you, you tick, you've ticked that box, okay, because, and, and, I, and I take that seriously. I, 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 as soon as I hear someone bringing a tongue, I immediately go to the Holy Spirit and say, what is it, and do you want me to interpret it? Um, because I want to see the gifts in operation as much as possible. Anyway, moving on. Verse 13. Therefore, um, well, let's back up a little bit. So he talks about some of the limitations of tongues in a public gathering. In verse 13, uh, verse 12. So you yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, um, try to excel Strive to excel in building up the church. Again, here's what Paul is interested in. Building up, building the house. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I'll sing praise with my spirit, and I will sing with my mind also. And I found that there's a, there's a really helpful spiritual exercise in this. So remember, your spirit knows things your mind doesn't know. We're also told every tongue means something, and if you speak in tongues, you can pray that you might interpret. And then Paul says, so what do I do? He says, well, I'm going to sing in the spirit, and I'll sing in my understanding. I'll pray in the spirit, and I pray in my understanding. And um, what I'd like us to do, just to kind of get warmed up a little bit in the the classroom of the Holy Spirit. I know Dave had us all speak in tongues a little bit together earlier. I want to encourage, this is what we're going to do. I'm going to ask you to, um, for every one of us to um, speak in tongues, uh, we're, we're allowed to all do that at the same time because we know that's what we're doing. We're not causing confusion. We know that we're all just speaking and praying at the same time. And then I'm going to pray, like Paul says here, that we might interpret. And then what I'm going to encourage you to do is to stop speaking in tongues and just carry on speaking in English or any other, if, if you have a, a if, if another language is your mother tongue, then go for that one. Um, and just see what comes out. Just see what comes out of your mouth when you begin praying in English. Um, and um, what I love, and I think I mentioned this on Sunday, what I love is that the way the Holy Spirit, he loves to be involved in us learning things together things of the Spirit. Paul says, I don't want you to be uninformed about the things of the Spirit. I want you to know the things of the Spirit. And you know what? Paul, I, Paul want, I want you to know more the, the things of the Spirit. Paul wanted even more for you to know the things of the Spirit. He wrote a book so that you would know about it. And the Holy Spirit wants it even more than Paul does. Okay, so, and he's the one that's going to make it happen. And um, I, used to, I used to kind of be slightly nervous in these situations. I thought it was a little bit presumptuous 
that you know, the Holy Spirit will turn up and do things, but then I realize, actually, that's only presumptuous if I think that I'm the one that's leading this session, and if I remember that actually he's the one leading this session, then it's no longer presumptuous, it's just me being obedient. So that's okay, we'll do that. So, <laughs> shall we, um, if, 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 you, if you feel comfortable and able to, I'm going to encourage you to stand up, just because you've been sat down for a little while now. And we're all just going to speak in tongues. I recommend you just use a normal voice. If you want to whisper, you can. If you want to shout, you can. But, you know, we can just do it with a normal voice. And we're just going to speak in tongues together for a couple of minutes, two, three minutes. And then I'm going to pray. And then I'm going to ask you just, just to switch into English and just see what's, what the Spirit has been bringing out from you. Okay, so let's just begin to speak in tongues together, shall we? Keliambara sotoro sokoro shupro to sontoro kase. Si ambaro yo sombro sokoro shiti ambara sotoko sambara sete. Ki alayapara sotoro shoko sambo soto siti ambara sonto. Ki sambara soti ambo kosoto. Kembara soti kasi ambara sholo kosi ambara. Ki ambara sotoro soti ambara shoto kosambara soto. Ki ayara basoto ro sho koro soto ko sambara sonto. Lashto ko ko siti ya poro sondoro se. Sembara soti ki ambara se, sembara seti andoro. Ko ko sambo seti di andoro shoto. Sha po soti ya po soto ko sambara seti di ambara ko sandoro sho. Lala ka shiti ambara sola si ki ambara. Sambara soti ambara shoto ko se ambara. La koro sondoro seti ambara so. Shiti ala kasi ambaro solo kosi ambaro sho. Rato kosi ti ambaro sho ti ambaro santo. Ki ambaro sho ti ri ambaro so kurosi ti ambaro sho toro se ki ambaro. La 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 kasi ti ambaro. Kambaro sho ti ambaro solo kosi ambaro so ti. Ki ambo solo kosi ti ambaro sho kurosi ti ambaro santo. Rasto kuriento. Holy Spirit, I ask that. Right now, you give us the ability and the power to interpret these tongues as we turn and, and turn our praise into English and our prayers into English, Lord. Empower us and equip us to interpret what we've been praying in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, just switch and now just begin to pray and speak in English. Let the prayer of your heart come out. The Spirit teaches us how to pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sambro Koko Sambro Shoti Yambro Santo. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the well of living water, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the river of life. Thank you, Lord, for streams in the desert. Thank you, Lord, for springs of living water, Lord God. Praise you. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in this place you are digging fresh wells, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that in this place. Lord, you are causing living water to spring up. Lord, thank you, Lord, that in these lives, Lord God, you are causing a flow of your spirit to come again and again and again. Lord, thank you for the streams that make glad the city of God. Thank you, Lord, they're the same streams that bring life to the desert and to the wilderness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Okay, we're going to stop. Well, this isn't the only time we're going to do this. We're going to stop there, and I'm going to ask, um, I'm going to ask you uh, what happened and see if anyone's brave enough to tell us. So, first of all, who, did anyone, did, um, who found it fairly easy to immediately switch and start speaking in English? Fairly easy, okay. Who found it, okay, it wasn't, it wasn't exactly easy, but I, I got there. Yeah? Okay, all right. Good. Um, now, uh, how many of you f um, found that you were praying about something that you were already familiar with? A situation you already know, yeah. Okay. How many of you were surprised by what you found you were praying? Wait, Dave, would you be happy to share what it was that you were surprised about? If, you, if the answer is no, that's fine. But. Uh. <laughs> um. I was aware I was speaking to the God of the universe, mm. the great creator, um, and the word, I'm sorry for the language, but the word macrocosm and microcosm came to mind. Mm. The God who created all that, all the galaxies, 
of which we are a tiny part, but the God who created me in my inmost being, every cell and fiber of my being. And I just feel that I'm part of something so wonderful. And uh, he's the Lord of the lot. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, how many of you found that while you were speaking in tongues, you were, things were coming to mind? Yeah, so sometimes people get worried about that because it says when I speak in tongues, my mind is unfruitful. So let's just clear that one up. Um, what that means, I believe, is that what is in your, the thoughts that come to you are not coming from your mind. <laughs> they're coming from the Spirit. They are the, they're, they are the fruit of, of, of what the Spirit is praying. And I've met so many people when they said, you know, oh, I, I, I struggle because when I speak in tongues, I keep having these thoughts. You know, I was speaking in tongues and I kept thinking about my friend and this situation they were in. I was going, okay, that's actually probably the Holy Spirit saying that's, that's what he wants you to be praying about because that's what he is praying about. That's what he is interceding with you from. Anyone, anyone think that what they, um, uh, that, uh, what, perhaps uh, was anyone that when you, when you began to speak, it actually wasn't a prayer. It was actually like a full-on prophecy. Anyone find that? No? Any of you find, any of you sense that what you were praying, you think, well, actually, this was, this was more than just a prayer. This, this, this is, there was something kind of prophetic in that. There was something that God was leading and directing. Yeah, okay, okay. Because like Paul says, you know, if I speak in a tongue, but what benefit in this? It's the, I bring knowledge, prophecy, teaching, revelation. Um, anyone else want to? Anyone else particularly want to share what it was they were praying? Because you thought it was kind of either significant or interesting, or might be helpful to everyone else. Anyone? Anyone? Go on, go on, Debbie. Yeah. I was pre ended up praying just about the grace that God gives us in that, similar to David really, is that we are so small, mm. um, but God uses us mm. and how gracious he is that he gives us his grace and favor and puts us in the right place at the right time mm. to speak to somebody who you didn't know had a need, but he uses us yeah. and how amazing is that that the god of the universe will say can you just go over there and i just mm, want to give mm. you this opportunity so, yeah and it, so that okay so that's really interesting that we've got two people that there's been this kind of contrast between the greatness and the vastness of god and the kind of the intimacy either at a personal level or at, at personal contact was anyone else found they were praying something similar to that was that was there was that a little mm, yeah <laughs> Yeah, and here as well. Do you want? Do you want to share with us what you were praying? Oh, you can't remember. Generally, generally, uh, generally, I was thanking God that yeah. He was so great and everything was so wonderful that He'd made, and yet He was sort of showing us things, showing me things, and showing us things day by day. Yeah, that sort of thing. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, um, we're going to do this again. And, um, and, and this time, and sometimes when we do this, it's kind of similar, and sometimes it can be quite different um, in terms of, of, of what the Holy Spirit kind of shows you and gives you. So um, it's, it's all right if it feels a bit awkward, by the way. Um, that's fine. Uh, we, uh, we don't mind a bit of awkward. That's fine. Um, God's working in that, and God's, God's helping us overcome some of our, uh, uh, perhaps our kind of shyness and and reluctance and whatever. So let's, let's do that again. Let's all just speak, speak in tongues for, for a couple of minutes together. Um, because actually, this is, this is one of the ways. I remember, um, I, I remember speaking to, um, or, or hearing, I think, Kerry Jones talk. And, or, um, it wasn't in a large setting, but he, when he was saying some of the most profound prophecies he's received has been when he has prophesied over himself, interpreting his Prayers, of, prayers in tongues, prayers in the Spirit. <laughs> because remember what I said, your spirit knows things that your mind doesn't know. Your spirit knows things about you that your mind doesn't know. <laughs> so let's pray in tongues together, and then again I will just pray briefly, and we'll, we'll see what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, let's just lift our voices again. Thank you, Jesus. Shalaka kariyamburo soto. Ki ala pasotori ambrosu kurositi ambrosho tukosamburu. 
Ki ambolo so coro siti ambolo sholo co siti ambolo shunto. Colo soti ambolo solo so coro sambolo shoto rose. Le ambolo soto co siti ambolo shoto co sambolo sere ki ambolo sunto. Ki ambolo solo co siti ambolo. Ki si ambolo solo co sambolo soti ambolo. Kai ambolo so coro shentere se ki siti ambolo solo co sambolo sheti ando. Holy Spirit, we ask for your equipping and your empowering to interpret what our spirits have been praying to our Father in the name of Jesus. Amen. You just begin to speak in English now, whether it's a prayer or a prophecy or whatever it might be, just begin to speak. Just keep speaking. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. If you need to switch back into tongues and then across to English again, you feel free to do that. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Okay, how many, uh, how many found it a bit different that time? Yes, a different experience. Um, did anyone find that when they were speaking, they were prophesying? Yeah? Do you, do you think they were, they were, it, was a prophetic, it was prophetic words that we all need to hear? They might not be. I'm not saying they are. But if they do, then we want to hear them, of course. <laughs> yeah. The, use the mic, because I think this is so that people on the stream can uh, hear what's going on. Okay. Thanks, Ben. For I want you to know, says God, that in these days I'm raising up you as pacemakers. Pacemakers, not pace setters. For as pacemakers, I raise you up to get alongside people and take them to the end of the race. Hmm. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Who else had something that they think is something we all need to hear? Yeah? Debbie and then Julia. You are going to be a catalyst as you've been asking me for more spiritual gifts and more opportunities. You're going to get more opportunities and you are going to take the opportunities. And the more opportunities that you take, the more you're going to get. And you are going to be a catalyst in your community. Yeah, very good. Julia. When you lift up your tongue and praise me to me it's like breathing in the fragrance the perfume of a rose because I delight in you I have made you and redeemed you and I take delight in what I see and when you speak to another whether you're just asking about their situation or whether you're asking about what's happening in their life, 
that fragrance, because it is my Holy Spirit, is wafting over them so that they feel the fragrance of God. So they are breathing in God from you as you speak. And the more you do it, the more they will become aware of the God who holds them, the God who wants to reach to them. Mm. No, that's good. Anyone else? I suspect there is another something else we need to hear because this is really interesting kind of illustratively. Yeah? Come on then. To be honest, I'm not quite sure on that, this. but That's while fine. This is, the, this is the classroom of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> while I was speaking in tongues, yeah. all as I could see was this huge, like, mansion-like building. And I tried to shake it off at, as I was talking, and it just kept coming and coming and coming mm. and then I thought as I started speaking in, in English or praying mm. in English it was coming you have many rooms to go into to be the person that you need to be mm -hmm. and each room has something else for you mm -hmm. and that was as far as yeah. I got okay yeah very good yeah I was just um, as I was praying I was I was really worshipping uh thinking about God as the sunlight and um, just the light, the radiance and the warmth of, of his presence. Um, and then I prayed in tongues a bit more. Uh, and then it was coming to me that, that God calls each one of us to be that in the world mm -hmm. and that he's going to shine out through us. Mm -hmm. It was really not just that he wants us to do that, but that we are that. Yeah. We are light in the world. Mm -hmm. And as, as we come into sort of presence of, of people in our work and our families and so on, this radiance is going to shine out more mm. and more. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Okay. So I, what, what's really helpful with this is I think that this really illustrates something. Yeah, you can take your seats for a little while if you like. Um, By the way, I'm sure there's lots of unfinished and partially formed and all kinds of bits and pieces of revelation that are bouncing between your spirit and your mind right now, and that's, that's fine and good, and the Holy Spirit will find an outlet for all of those. Uh, but Bernie brought a, a, a prophetic word, and it, did anyone feel that it, it seemed quite short and he finished fairly abruptly? Yeah, okay. And I'm really grateful for that because it's a good illustration of what we didn't quite get as far in 1 Corinthians 14, where it says two or three prophets should speak and the others should weigh what is said. And there's a principle in the scripture that a matter is established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And I think when we come together as the church, the, the way in which we, you all may prophesy will very often be that the prophecy doesn't come in one complete whole to one person. And so we have a word about a pacemaker, yeah? Which way, where, which way around was it, Bernie? Pacemaker, okay? And then we have a word about a catalyst. <laughs> and both about kind of causing others to run, causing others, provoking others into action. And then we have a word about filling the place with the fragrance of Christ and over here filling where we go with the light of Christ. But both about this idea and the, I think the kind of many rooms and exploring to different places kind of fits in, does kind of fit in the middle of that. This idea that wherever we go, we're bringing this revelation of Jesus. And I think the Holy Spirit deliberately... <laughs> One of the ways he actually helps us, it does, it does all kinds of things when, he, when he, he, he makes a word, a complete word, out of individual pieces. It shows us that we're all hearing from the same spirit. We're all hearing the same thing. It reminds us that none of us have the complete picture. None of us can elevate ourselves and say, well, you know, unless you hear a prophetic word from me. Uh, no, it shows, we, it shows us we need each other. The body needs each other. It shows us that there is this, you know, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the common good. 
it shows us that when we come together, each one has. Because you don't actually have to get very many people in a room. We've probably already passed the limit here where you couldn't each one of us actually brings something in every meeting, but it shows that we each have something to bring. And I think as well that what I love about these two words here and this kind of like exploring the house idea as well is that God, the Holy Spirit, even in this, and actually the other, the other words as well, that it's about the impact it's having on others which could be the others here, but is, is very much also the others out there. That the Holy Spirit wants to use us and to equip us so that we are taking Christ everywhere we go. So what, one of the things, let's talk a little bit about, because I think this is what I was supposed to talk about, um, <laughs> how, we, how, we, how we hear from the Holy Spirit and how we then bring a prophetic word. Um, one of the things to say about prophetic words is they don't have to be elaborate. I, I, I was really grateful to Bernie that he brought that word and it was concise and short and kind of, because I think sometimes we think, well, it's, it's, I've got to make it impressive. And actually in doing that, we often obscure what the Holy Spirit's actually saying. What does Paul say here? He talks about, I'd rather speak five intelligible words. You know, one of the most, um, the, the, there was a prophetic word that came once that, that, that stirred up the spirits of all the people to build the house, and that word was, I am with you. <laughs> Four words in Haggai. Four words was enough to get the job done. In um, Habakkuk chapter 2, it talks about uh, that though you, although the word seems to tarry, although it seems to, it, although it seems to be delayed, wait for it because it will surely come. And when it comes, write it down. And, and it says, write it on a tablet. And in those days, of course, to send messages, you'd have, this, you'd have a little wooden frame with, a, uh, with, some, with some wet clay in it, and you would scratch the message in the wet clay, and then the, 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 the herald, the runner, would take it. It says, write it down, make it plain, that the one who reads it may run. And there's a double meaning in that, which is, you know, one that make it short enough that the guy can actually run <laughs> and get the message out quickly, but also that whoever reads it is themselves compelled to run. You know, the word makes you run. The simplicity of the word, uh, the succinctness of the word, and often, here's a, here's a common mistake we make when we prophesy. We get something from the Spirit, we bring it, we think it doesn't sound like enough, and we just keep talking. And, and the problem is, it, it rarely leads people into heresy and error, um, or backsliding, or anything like that. What it, what it just does, is it just kind of creates a bit of fog around what God is actually saying, and, and we have to kind of try and pick the meat from the bones. Yeah, whereas if we, if we stop, we, what, we, what, what we often find is it provokes someone else to go, oh, I've got the next bit. I can, I can bring what comes next. And it's really helpful, isn't it? Because sometimes, I don't know if you're anything like me, you're sat there and there's, you think the Holy Spirit is saying something to you. In fact, you know the Holy Spirit is saying something to you, but you don't really know what to do with it. You don't feel it's quite at the place where you can stand up and prophesy it. And so you just kind of wait there. And, and, and you know what is wonderful when it happens is, is that someone else stands and says something, and as soon as they begin talking, you go, oh, now I know. Now I know where this fits. Oh, I can bring this bit, even to the point that Paul says, if revelation comes to one that's sitting down, the one that's speaking should stop. <laughs> I've, I've only ever done that once. <laughs> and it was many, many years ago with, uh, with a good friend of mine, Andrew Corfey, who many of you will remember. And I think we were in Manchester. And I was, I was talking, and I, got, I was halfway through a sentence, and I, I didn't even really pause for a breath. And he stood up on the front seat and just carried on. And um, it was the most strange and, and kind of wonderful experience as well, because it was like, oh, that's, that's just like in the Bible. <laughs> um, but, and, God, and God was using that as a sign, I think, to, you know, to show and, and to teach. But, but I think if, we, if, we, if we're careful that what we bring is we just bring what we've got, and if it feels like it's incomplete, go, good, because now there's a demand on the prophetic gift in someone else in the room... <laughs> To, to fill this word out, to bring the next part, so that we can see how this fits together. So one of the things that we've been doing is, is very clearly something that is a trigger for the prophetic word, which is to speak in, the, in, in tongues, to speak in the Spirit, to be in the Spirit. John says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, 
he must have been having some time in the Spirit because he then wrote the book of Revelation out of that <laughs> being in the Spirit. Um, I always find it fascinating as well that he says, I was in the Spirit and I heard a voice behind me. <laughs> being in the Spirit doesn't necessarily mean you're pointing in the right direction. Sometimes the first thing that God needs to do is turn you around. Um, but but the, I know the first time we asked the question, probably about half of you put your hands up to say that while I was speaking in tongues, there were thoughts and ideas coming in my mind. When that happens, get into a conversation with the Holy Spirit. You remember in Jeremiah chapter 1, God says to Jeremiah, Jeremiah, what do you see? And he says, I see an almond branch. And um, if, the, if Jeremiah had, be, had just, you know, got to that point in his ministry and thought, I've made it, I've had a vision, um, you know, and, and that's what he wrote down. I saw, as it were, that's Ezekiel, isn't it? As it were. I saw, as it were, a branch. Twas the branch of an almond tree. And kind of gone on to describe it in great detail and what you could see in the background and all that. And, and that's it. There you go. There's the book of Jeremiah. Okay, we wouldn't have been hugely um, edified, would we? But because the Holy Spirit wasn't trying to get him to convey the message to the people here's a picture of an almond branch. He, he, there was a much bigger message, but he wanted to get his attention. And he used this vision in, in what I presume is his mind's eye, like, like we have. Like often perhaps when you're praying or speaking in tongues, you might think of something or you might see something. And he says, Jeremiah, what do you see? And, the way, and what we find, the footnote in your Bible will tell you this, is there's a little play on words. Because when he speaks out loud the words, I see an almond branch, but the phrase almond branch in Hebrew sounds just like watching over. Okay, so the two phrases sound the same. And so God says, yes, because I'm watching over my word to perform it. Now we're getting somewhere. Now there's a dialogue between the prophet and God, and he engages in this conversation. The Holy Spirit wants to engage us in conversation. So when he begins to show you something or say something to you, say, well, tell me more about this, Lord. <laughs> what are you saying to me? What do you, what do you want me to do with this? And, uh, you know, we can be, um, I, remember, I remember many years ago when I, was, when I first left school, so it was a very long time ago, I went on a go team in Stirling in Scotland. And um, at that time... We were planting a church there. This was 1988. And to my knowledge, there were no charismatic churches in the, in the town at that time. And so we, quite early on, gathered a few people who had been baptized in the Spirit and had had no outlet for that for years because there was no, there was no local church for them to do that, to so move in the gifts of the Spirit. And we had this one, this one chap who I remember at the time I thought was a very old man. And in hindsight, he was probably about the age I am now. <laughs> He was, he, was, he was a lovely, lovely guy, but he was, he was a little out of practice in the gifts of the Spirit. And um, uh, I remember in, in one gathering we were there, and uh, he stood up and he said, I have ha I've had a, a vision. I've seen a raspberry. And then he sat down. That was it. As if to say, you know, anyone got the interpretation of that vision? <laughs> And um, I was 18 at the time and, and was probably given much more responsibility than was good for anyone in leading meetings. And um, I, I must have, I was, I was, I was struggled not to at least, you know, have a little smirk at that. <laughs> and another time, another time, uh, this brother, he stood up and he said, thus saith the Lord, I feel that I have more to say, but I do not know what it is. <laughs> and... <laughs> Now, the thing is, in, as I've kind of, as I've got to know the ways of the Spirit a little bit better, I know exactly where both of those things were coming from. The first one was just like Jeremiah, but he didn't kind of engage in that dialogue with the Spirit to find out, well, what's the message? God, you've got my attention with a vision of a raspberry, but what is it that you want to say? The funny thing was that actually a few weeks before that, 
we'd been at the Bible Week in Wales, Bilth Wells. And God had told me to go and tell one of the elders of the church that I was in at the time that he was a strawberry. And, and I was like, Lord, I can't just go and tell him he's a strawberry. Please tell me what it is that I've got to, I've got to say about that. And God then told me, and it was to do with the way that a strawberry sends out runners and spreads. And it was about how he was going to minister in different places. So I had, I had very recent experience of, of the Holy Spirit showing me a picture of a fruit and me going, there's no way I'm just going to go and tell it. So in one sense, I've got admiration for the man that he was actually prepared to stand up and say in front of the church that he'd seen a raspberry. But um, it's, you know, so the Holy Spirit, he wants to engage us. And, and the other one, of course, what he actually meant was, it was perfectly right apart from the thus saith the Lord bit. What he meant was, I sense in the Spirit that God wants to say more, but I don't know what it is. So please, can we all just wait on God to hear what it is that he's got to say? That's exactly what he meant. You see, the content was actually spot on. He was right. We need to stay in this moment because the Spirit's got more to say. But his kind of rustiness in, <laughs> in how to deliver gifts of the Spirit or exhortations <laughs> made it come out in a very funny way. Um, but I thank God for those because they're great illustrations of, of how it is that, how do we engage with the Holy Spirit? How do we have a sense? How do we, you know, one of the things about being in a body is that we, not only do we, um, not only do we minister to one another, we can put demands on one another's gifts. You know, if you... We do that with things like a, an incomplete word. We do that with maybe just provoking one another and actually saying, you know, John, I know there's, there's a wonderful prophetic... I did this with a friend of mine recently, it wasn't John. But he said, there's a wonderful deposit of prophetic gift in you and I've not heard you prophesy for ages. A gentle poke. John's known for his gentleness, isn't he? So, so. <laughs> or in your conversations, you're having a conversation with someone and they share something, maybe something God said to them or something they see in the scripture. You go, you know what? I think we all need to hear that. I don't think that's just the Holy Spirit talking to you, I think that's for us. The other thing you'll find is that sometimes someone will, um, in fact, this happened on Sunday. Who was the lady, Dave, that came at the end and said that she'd had a very similar, God had said something very similar to her about what I prophesied to you? Uh, so at the end of the meeting, Sue came up to me and she said, I just wanted to say that at the, at the beginning of the meeting during the worship, I turned to my, was it her daughter? She said, I turned to my daughter and said, I think God's saying that Dave, the, 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 those things that Dave needs to stop doing. And at the end, she came, she said, that's what I believe God said to me. I said, well, first of all, I said, thank you so much, because that's a great encouragement to me. <laughs> but let's go and tell it to Dave. You see, something happens when we talked about this, didn't we, that God establishes a matter in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And it's not just to tick a box to say, yes, it was the right word. But something happens in that agreement. There's power in agreement. And sometimes, and I think maybe this answers a... Uh, 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 Dave was saying, showing with me a couple of the Q and A's that had come in for the uh, recording they're going to do. And one was around a question of how long do you hold on to a prophetic word that hasn't come to pass before you set it aside? And, and, and that's a difficult question, but one of the things I would say in that is that I believe, in, in particularly in significant directive words to our lives, God will not just speak once. And in fact, I've had words that I've received many, many years ago that I have, I have held and waited and not acted on because I knew that God would establish that word in a second witness. And actually, it could be many years later that that word came and I go, now's the time to move. Let me give you an example on that. When, when my wife and I got married, when Ruth and I got married, in 1996, um, I had moved, I had moved, I'd been living in Coventry until 1995, and I was asked to go and be part of the church in Hinckley. And I went to Hinckley, summer of 95, and um, initially was only asked to, to go and be there for a year. And, I, and at the beginning of, nine, at, at that same point that I was leaving, Ruth arrived in Coventry, 
and we, uh, we dated and courted and got engaged and got married, all within the space of that year, in fact, within the space of 10 months. She knew she was onto a good thing, and she wasn't going wasn't to let me go. So, uh, and at the end of that time, she was living in Coventry. I'd been in Hinckley for a year, but had previously been in Coventry. And we had to make a decision. When we get married, where are we going to live, and which church will we be a part of? And we both felt that we should be in Hinckley, but that God had not finished with us in Coventry. And so we both had this strong sense from God that at some point in our future, we will move to Coventry. Fast forward, what would it have been? 96, five years. And we're in a elders conference, in fact, in Coventry at the Techno Center, the Coventry University Techno Center. If you remember, we've did a couple of years, we did elders conferences there. And Anna Scargan got up and told a story, as Anna does, of how, you know, God had spoke, and they went here, and this happened, and all these people came to Christ, and all this happened, all, all, this, and all this stuff that makes us think, oh, I'm so inadequate, and <laughs> oh, Lord, give me more Anna. Um, but he'd made some comment in that, just, just in telling the story. There wasn't really anything, he wasn't making any kind of spiritual point about this. He said, but we'd heard about this, uh, this, t- this village, the other side of the mountain, and so we went there. And then he carried on telling the story. Kerry got up at the end and he said, he said, Anna said that they'd heard about this place, so they went there. There are places that God has spoken to you about and nothing will happen until you go there. And in that moment, Ruth and I looked at each other and said, it's time to move. So for five years we'd known, but then something came and said, now's the time. That's a very, very, very uh, minor version of what happens in Acts 13. Set apart Barnabas, Barnabas and Saul to the ministry to which I called them. Saul, now known as Paul, had known he was an apostle from the first days of his conversion, which was by this time, I think, at least eight years prior. Barnabas, we're not sure, but he had already been sent on a kind of an apostolic mission to Antioch anyway the year before. So what's happening there isn't they're saying, oh, tell these men they're apostles. It's actually saying, tell them that the time is now to step into their ministry. And, and sometimes a word can be there, and it's, you know, it's God's responsibility to establish that word in your life. And, and, some t- and, and one of the things that will do, and expecting that God will always bring that confirmation and bring that establishment to a word will help release you from kind of laboring under a word that may or may not be correct. And I think that's one of the reasons. It's one of the reasons that in the church, he speaks through multiple prophets. And I think Paul uses the term there to mean anyone that prophesies. And he says, I wish you would all prophesy, so he means you're all prophets in that context. <laughs> that's why in the church, we, we, we hear from multiple voices. That's why I was so blessed that I can bring a word to Dave that is, you know, clearly is not only means he's got to do stuff, it means other people have got to do stuff. Some of you need to ask, is, is my hand one of the hands that's outstretched to receive one of Dave's batons? Um, and Sue came and said, I thought, well, praise God. One, thank you, Holy Spirit, I heard you. <laughs> Two, thank you that you're establishing this word. And when it comes to personal prophecy, and we receive personal prophecy, um, Part of, the, part of the weighing, like, like I said on Sunday, if you receive something, you need to share that with someone. It needs to be weighed with someone. If it's significant about the, de- the direction and, and, of, and, and you know, the course of your life, share it with those who've been given the responsibility. Where's, where's Mike? Mike and Jeff and Dave, who've given, who have a responsibility. They stand before God and are called to account for the care that they have for you. So you really want... <laughs> to involve them in those big decisions of life. They have, a, they have a spiritual gifting to bring wisdom into them, and certainly to say, this is the word that's come. And sometimes, and, I, and, 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 I, and I've, um, again, it's, um, it's our friend Roger Aubrey. I remember thinking how audacious this was, but he told of a time when he said that he was an elder, and someone had come to the elders and said, I've had this word, I've carried it for years, but it, nothing seems to be happening. And, and, and he said, 
I release you from that word. It's like, can you do that? Can you do? <laughs> but his point was this. Obviously, his conviction was that that wasn't a, a true word. But actually, that's part of the that's part of what it means to shepherd the sheep, to to lift things off them that shouldn't be on them. And and sometimes we've we've carried something, and we've and perhaps it wasn't God in the first place. If it was, this is the thing I've this is the other thing I've learned, is that if we if we walk humbly with God and we put our lives in His hands and we want to serve Him, if we hear something, if there's a prophetic word that comes. And we think, I'm not sure that's, I'm not sure that's right. I, I don't think I can respond to that. And it was God. Uh, you can guarantee he's going to bring you that word again. <laughs> he's not going to go, well, you missed your chance there. You're destined to a life as a second-class Christian. No, because if our hearts are right, Lord, I want to serve you. But there's something that doesn't quite sit with it. The word of God should never, the prophetic word should never come and bring you into a place of, 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 of bondage or oppression or liberty. Be, you, can be, you can be open with it, you know, and it's not, and, it, and we go back to this, you know, don't despise prophecy, but test it and hold fast to what is good. And sometimes you might miss holding fast to something, but God in his grace and mercy, he'll come and he'll bring it again, and it'll come in another way, it'll come in another way. And... Um, this doesn't happen that often to me, but it happens often enough to know, um, you know, I can be going somewhere and I can, I can meet someone I've never met before and I can bring them a word and, and they'll say, you know what, that's exactly what God said to me three years ago. And I think, praise God. But also, what I think is, well, then you need to consider whether it's significant that this, the timing of this in terms of how you respond to it. Because if it's something that you've been carrying and now it's something that has come and been established then let's not just say, oh, isn't that nice that the word was right? Let's actually say, well, God's got something in this. Okay. We've not, we've not got very long, have we? So I've, I've talked more than I meant to, and you've talked less than I wanted you to. So <laughs> what? Um, how many of you, uh, would you say, are eager to prophesy right now? Okay. <laughs> well, go on. <laughs> okay. Um. Why don't you get into uh, groups of, of three or four? And what I'm going to do, what I'm going to ask you to do, is, um, is not to necessarily prophesy in a very directive, thus says the Lord, but just, um, just ask the Holy Spirit whether there's any, anything he's putting on your heart for one of the other people that you're standing with. Do you think we can do that? Okay, let's do that. So if you would like to get into groups of, of three or maybe four, something like that, and just ask the Holy Spirit, is there anything you're putting in my heart for this person? Folks, I know uh, it's, it's time for us to draw to a close. What I loved about that little exercise is that the, the buzz got louder and louder as you went on. Um, and, um, and you may have other things that you want to share. But I want you to imagine now having those kind of conversations and having that kind of intentionality of listening to the Holy Spirit when you're with people that don't know Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 16 says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. We regard no one according to the flesh. We can regard everyone we know and everyone we meet by the Spirit. And God has got something to say. I remember Kerry Jones one time saying, the only thing you need to do, the only thing you need to move in the word of wisdom is to believe that God has an opinion on everything. <laughs> the only thing you need to do to move in a word of wisdom is to believe that God has an opinion about everything. You can ask, Lord, what's your opinion? Lord, what does this person need to hear? Lord, what's this person going through, and how can I minister to them? Part of the gift of prophecy is the ministry of consolation. And it seemed to me that as you began to do that, it was a little bit awkward, and then it began to flow a bit. And um, 
I just want to, I just want to finish by praying, really, and I want to pray that, that that flow of listening to the Spirit, of seeing the raspberry but not kind of going, <laughs> but rather saying, Lord, what are you saying? <laughs> will be really effective in opening new opportunities to share the gospel. So, Lord, I pray. Holy Spirit, first of all, we want to say thank you. Thank you for being with us this evening. Thank you for how you've led us. Lord, forgive me for the times I got in the way, and thank you for the times that you used me to go where you wanted to go. Lord, thank you for the hearts of all these folk here who are so willing and open to be led by you and to know you better. And Lord, I pray, Lord, that there would be just a growing habit of the Spirit of walking with you in every situation, of listening to your promptings and your leadings. Lord, of leaving the house in the morning with the attitude of, what am I taking into the world from you? From what, am I, what, if, what am I bringing of heaven into the earth? Lord, I pray for a growing sensitivity and a discernment, Lord, and an insight. Lord, I pray that that the gifts of wisdom and knowledge and prophecy, Lord, will just flow as part of natural conversation, as part of our witnessing to the world. And Lord, I pray as well that you would increase our sensitivity to hear when you are bringing a word, Lord, that is a word of direction and a word of command and a word of instruction for your people. And Lord, we won't hold back in bringing those things. We'll bring what you say, And that's as much as we'll bring. And we'll believe that you will work it all together, Lord. So, Lord, I just ask that as we go from this place, we go with a fresh awareness of your presence with us, a fresh awareness of the power of your words in our mouth and the ability to be the fragrance of Christ and the light. Lord, to be those that are catalysts and pacemakers to those around us, Lord. And cause them to come and and run with that same vigor. Lord, that we might truly be your witnesses everywhere we go, every moment of every day, to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Amen.